the first time I came down with malaria. I had been in Africa, Belgium, Congo, for five years and was 11 years old. I had intermittent reoccurrences for the next 10 years, but never as bad as the first time. Even today, I cannot donate blood because I had malaria. Although the ecological and environmental conflict over the usage of DDT was a difficult task to resolve, many cooperative scientists joined together to find an effective and neutral product to combat malaria. Before the 1960s, malaria in the U.S. was commonplace. In 1874, Othmar Zeller, a German pharmacist, had been working on a drug called DDT to eliminate malaria. In 1939, a Swiss chemist tested DDT on mosquitoes. After sharing his results, the chemist named Hermann Müller received the Nobel Prize. DDT was extremely effective at killing mosquitoes. It was first introduced in World War II and sprayed on the South Pacific to kill mosquitoes. DDT was used extensively in the 1940s and regular sprayings on trees were common. Inside houses, people brought aerosols of DDT to kill houseflies. All in all, this new insecticide made life easier. But in the 1950s, DDT's problems started to show up. In 1962, Rachel Carson, author of Silent Spring, brought to life the issues with DDT. Her persuasive writing and objective stories made many people rethink DDT. Nearly a decade later, on December 31, 1972, the United States banned DDT. Conflict ensued among various groups due to the ban of DDT. For example, the petrochemical industry was upset because they had made a lot of DDT and could no longer sell it in the U.S. Farmers were upset because they thought that their productivity rate would drastically drop. And lastly, public health officials worried of an epidemic of malaria. Public health officials worried because of money and health, and ultimately valued the people. On the other side of the conflict, there were environmentalists who worried of continued use of DDT and its impact on the environment. This side ultimately valued the environment. In 1958, Medical doctor Charles S. Petty wrote in a medical journal about two cases in which people were negatively affected by DDT and other organic chemicals. One of these cases is about a 44-year-old physician who, in 1944, decided to spray his lawn once a week with DDT. About a year later, this man was hospitalized. This man recovered, but still had chronic pain and signs of weight loss and anorexia. When DDT was first introduced into the U.S., we didn't notice the decline of our national pride, the bald eagle. In the 1950s, first signs of the decline were observed. Observe this graph of bald eagles in Colorado. Before 1973, there are few bald eagles, and only in 1979 is there an incline in the amount of these valiant birds. The cause of these birds going on the endangered list is partly because of DDT. DDT causes bird eggs to thin and causes malfunctions in the reproductive organs. The government did many things to warn people about DDT. To the people, the government said to cut down and stop unnecessary use of this harmful insecticide. The government suggested to not use DDT on edible items and things that humans come in contact with. They also said that DDT can and has caused deaths in the past. The government also said to farmers to not apply DDT to the edible parts of a plant and to not use on milk cows or cows being prepared for slaughter. The farmers were also warned that an entomologist, Dr. P. N. Anand, observed that high concentrations of DDT easily get into milk if a cow is near this harmful insecticide. Though there is currently a coalition among the government, organizations, and many environmental writers involved in fixing the problem that DDT has created, there is still one question. 
what next? In countries like Africa, where even DDT may be too expensive, how can we arrive at a compromise? Can we just let millions of people, many of them in Africa, die from malaria each year? Many organizations and individuals are saying that this is not a stopping point. This is the, just the beginning of new research. This ban was devastating to many people. College professor Bob Sievers shares his opinion on this ban. When it was discovered that it was so persistent, it survived so long, and it went through and into uh, other life forms like birds, then people started looking for insecticides that would not have this long lifetime. But there's a trade-off there. Roger Garcia, a man who lived through the pain and trauma of malaria, believes that DDT should not be used to eradicate malaria. With all the environmental side effects seen from DDT, I personally believe it should be a last resort option. Between the new medications available, mosquito netting for sleeping at night, and educating people to get rid of standing water that is a breeding ground for mosquitoes, it could be possible to keep malaria under control. Another example of people solving this problem is the Gates Foundation. In 2007, they have pledged to donate $258 million to the research and many bed nets to help fight malaria. With all these people working together to gather information and thoughts, maybe someday a vaccine, a repellent, or other type of preventative can be made. But until then, millions of children and many adults die every year from this horrible disease. But recently, the World Health Organization has completely changed their view on DDT. After 30 years of telling countries to not use DDT, the World Health Organization has approved indoor residual spraying of DDT and has said that it is the best form of control for malaria. They say that DDT really isn't that harmful if used properly. Philip Cotticelli of the Africa Fighting Malaria Organization, who has convinced the World Health Organization to promote DDT, shares his opinion. If, if DDT is supposed to cause, potentially cause cancer in someone, you know, this is cancer is a sort of disease that doesn't develop until very late in life, when you're in your 50s, 60s, or 70s. But malaria, if, you're, if you uh, die of malaria, chances are it's before you even reach the age of five. So in other words, if you simplify it, it's like telling someone they can't have DDT and, and knowing that they will probably die from malaria um, and you know, worrying about the potential risk of cancer 60 years later. So even if there were proof, which there isn't, that it would still be a difficult balance um, to not use DDT or to deny countries to potentially use the DDT. Although someday a compromise may be reached, it is important to look back on why this problem began. This conflict is just a branch of many others that we see in today's society. The roots of t this conflict are based in human behavior. When DDT was invented, its purpose was to fight malaria, yet it was sold and bought commercially in aerosol cans to kill houseflies. In this way, DDT changed society. It was told to be a miracle, so humans used it as a gateway to do less work. All in all, in order to really compromise, society and the, uh, the ways in which we act must change. So what will it be next? If we create another preventative or insecticide, will we overuse it? Or will we take what we have learned from history, from the past to envision the future, so that we don't keep making the same mistakes